Good evening, everybody. This is Alan Blumkin on the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. And after a uh, three-month hiatus, uh, we are. Uh, I'm here with David Nemec, and we're going to uh, do a new segment of uh, David Nemec's histor- baseball histor- history and trivia. And uh, as I said, it's been. Uh, we I think we did our last uh, uh, podcast on this in early July. And since then, David uh, yeah. moved out to California, where he's going through a little bit of a heat wave there. So welcome back, David. It's been a while. It has been a pleasure to be with you again. Okay. And what we have been, what we were doing before, we were, we were giving uh, baseball history by seasons. And uh, the last season we gave was 1962. Uh, so tonight we plan to do 1963 and 1964. And... Uh, uh, just for, you, uh, for everybody's notification, this will stop uh, with 67, 68 in a couple of weeks because we are not uh, prepared and uh, have no interest in going into uh, uh, this for the divisional play because it uh, gets too uh, diffuse at that point. Now we good spend, word. Uh, exactly. you know, exactly spend good word. Uh, an hour on just on... 1969 alone, and there were a whole bunch of other seasons in that time frame that you, you can just take up uh, an hour on. So uh, this uh, series will end uh, with 1968 in a couple of weeks. So anyway, David, let's get started in 1963, which yeah. was a very weird year because uh, they did two things to the playing rules, one of which lasted for a while, the other which didn't. Uh, the first one was the widening of the strike zone, which uh, eventually would turn out to be a uh, disaster uh, because uh, this would turn into a, it would turn in basically toward the second dead ball era, from 1963 yeah. through 1968. And the other one was the balks. The National League especially decided that they were going to strictly enforce the balk rules. rules. The pitch had to come to a one-second stop before throwing the pitch. And uh, the umpires in the National League, led by a veteran Hall of Famer, Al Barlick, said they want balks, we'll give them balks. So for the first uh, six weeks or so, uh, the National League umpires were calling balks almost every time pitchers stepped out on the mound. And all, all sorts of balk records uh, were set during that period before... Uh, uh, they got the uh, powers that be uh, got wise and decided to put a stop to it. Do you have any comments on the strike zone and the uh, blocks? Uh, um, well, the block rule didn't last long, but the strike zone did and it really impacted the game in ways that uh, I felt were pretty negative. And I have to admit my interest in baseball uh, began to decline um slowly at first but by 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 1967 68 um i i was dozing off when i was watching games on tv uh you know there was so so little scoring uh except for home runs that's the only thing really that stood out from the dead ball era the dead ball era six or seven home runs was a good season uh, in uh, the six, late 60s, there were, there were guys who hit 25 home runs with 52 RBIs and probably hit about 216. Uh, you know, there were just uh, incredible stats were being compiled, negative for hitters and, and you know, out, out, of, out, of, out of sight for pitchers. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's impacted the game ever since, really, because we, I, I don't think it's ever gotten back to what it was in the 50s. Um, maybe it never will. And what we're seeing now is, is almost the total opposite of what we saw in the, what we saw in the mid and late sixties. Strikeouts, you know, walks, home, home runs. runs. Yeah, strikeouts, walks, and home runs. That's that's the whole game. Uh, yeah, in nineteen sixty-eight, I got to the point in nineteen sixty-eight uh, where I'd rather go to the racetrack than the ballpark. That's yeah, how bad it got yeah. for me, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I missed the World Series that year because I was in the basic training at the Fort Dix 
I would rather have been watching the World Series. And uh, the, 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 both the, there's the last year of the ten man leagues and the ten team leagues, and both pennant races were over in June. And uh, the only thing that even uh, saved that that season a little bit is, uh, was the World Series that year. But we'll get into that deeply in a couple of weeks. Well, anyway, the fact that the, uh, the Yankees were coming off uh, another another World Series champion. And in the National League, the, in 62, the uh, Giants had beaten the Dodgers in a uh, three-game playoff and for the National League pennant and then uh, lost in a seven-game series to the Yankees. So the Yankees were favored in the American League, and the Dodgers, even though they had lost uh, before because uh, uh, they were, get, were getting a healthy Sandy Koufax back, uh, were the favorites in the National League, and both of them won. And the Yankees had a fairly easy race. The American League that year was pretty bad. And the White Sox uh, uh, finished ten and a half games behind the Yankees, and they were second place. The uh, Yankees were injury riddled that year and still were able to win 100, uh, it was 104 games and uh, win the pennant very easily. Mickey Mantle uh a couple of weeks after he had a uh, home run off uh, Kansas City's Bill Fisher that was climbing, landed halfway up the third deck in Yankee Stadium and was climbing as it hit the seats up there. Uh, he uh, crashed into the fence in the center field in Baltimore, and uh, his foot caught in the fence, and he was out for uh, uh, 10 weeks because of that. But it didn't matter. They inserted... Uh, they moved to Trust to center field. They inserted Hector Lopez in left field. And uh, basically because because of uh, uh, timely hitting and their pitching, which um, was second in the league to the White Sox. The White Sox were a much poorer hitting team than the Yankees were. Uh, Whitey Ford was 24-7, and seven, and Jim Bouton was 21-7. and seven. And they were able to romp in the American League that year. Yeah, you're right. It was really it was an exciting year. Uh, and being from Cleveland, um, I lost interest pretty much after Memorial Day. Uh, although the Indians did have a way of, of usually having a pretty good uh, first 30, 40, 50 games. Yeah, they're, they're, they're June. Sometimes June going, have, yeah. Sometimes going, you know, even deep into June before they folded. Usually by the Fourth of July, they were out of it. And um, they did. They did have a couple of seasons in the early '60s where they did seem to like they might hang around a while, but, but it, uh, it faded quickly. And that was true for most most American League teams. Uh, the Yankees really have been dominant for so long. Uh, some teams have been down for so long that uh, baseball in the American League was pretty undramatic all in all. Yeah, there were a couple of trades that. Uh in the American League that uh, were uh, fairly, uh, you know, the American League teams that they, the Red Sox picked up Dick Stewart from the Pirates. And Stewart that year managed to lead the uh, American League in RBIs. And he had 42 home runs, which was second only in the league to uh, Homer Killebrew's uh, 45. And Killebrew uh, that year uh, set the record uh, uh, for fewest RBIs uh, with a 40-plus home run season, he drove in 45 home run season. He drove in 96 on 45 home runs. And Kari Yastrzemski won the first of his uh, three batting championships that season. But the American League was really, really, uh, uh, it was pitching dominated. It was done, though. The other uh, big trade uh, sent uh, Louis Aparicio uh, to to the uh, and Al Smith from the White Sox to the Orioles, and the Orioles wound up with Hoyt Wilhelm. Uh, Pete Ward, third baseman, shortstop Ron Hansen, and as an extra attraction, the big bonus baby flop named Dave Nicholson. Yes. Who the Orioles, in their uh, infinite wisdom, uh, given $175,000 to a year or two before, and uh, Nicholson only had one regular year with the White Sox, and that was 1963, 
We proceeded to uh, bat 229 and strike out 175 times, you know, which is not a, a strikeout number is not really not nothing now, but back then it was a record that held up for uh, quite a few years. Yeah, there, there, were, you know, there, were, there weren't any, any quite as, uh, you know, alarmingly uh, strikeout prone as Nicholson, but there were, there were quite a few hitters in those years, quite a few young guys who obviously had talent and did get big money. And uh, they just came up in baseball at the wrong time. They really did. I mean, Harmon Killebrew, uh, for one, uh, bonus baby with the Washington Senators, uh, you know, they, the Senators going nowhere gave him every chance, and finally he put it together. And by 1959, he was one of the uh, b- biggest pop, big power hitters in baseball, but never much for average. But think of Harmon Killebrew. If Harmon Killebrew would play 30 years later in the 90s or in the early 2000s, uh, Harmon Killebrew, I think, would have been a, considered a really great player. But um, because he was playing in an era when hitting, when averages were depressed and hitting in general was depressed, um, while his totals were good at home runs and usually an RBI. Yeah, he was not exactly a gazelle defensively. Well, he was decent. He was decent. No, they, they, he they, the they had caddies for him. Whatever we played, he, they were caddies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And why? He, they really, the Senators actually saw him as a shortstop. Oh, and, God. Uh, initially. Well, and... and uh, yeah, I think he's the only, only, you know, his first, you know, it's he and Banks and uh, and Gary Sheffield, I think, are the only 500 homer guys who started out at shortstops. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I think they're the only three. Well, the only three uh, bonus babies that came out of that whole, uh, you know, that whole time when they had to keep them on the roster for two years that made any good were really good were. Uh, a Killebrew, uh, K. Ryan, Koufax. I took Koufax yeah. uh, six years before he got his, uh, you know, you know got his uh, act together. But K. Ryan uh, won the batting championship when he was 21 years old, 1955. Yeah. Uh, after having a, a pretty poor year all in all as a rookie in 1954. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, he, and he, you know, he hung around until the D.H., Came into came into existence, saved his career, and brought him over three thousand hits. And, uh, yeah, he, uh, you, know, you know, when he was playing the outfield in the, as a regular in nineteen fifty four, he was uh, nineteen years old. Yeah, <laughs> playing a full season, which uh, you know, not not too many players do. No, no, he was an extraordinary fielder, and another guy who got caught. He got caught. Um, you know, I, I, again, if he, if, if, you know, he, you know, by the by the mid '60s when he should have had, he's still been in his prime, his his averages were dropping into the 260s, 250s too. And uh, you know, he he probably would have been, he should have been probably a career 300 year, but he but he wasn't. Uh, very, there were very very few guys who had a career of any length who had close to 300 career batting averages. In the 60s and 70s, and that that began almost, you know, expansion was was delusive. It um, hitting, you know, hitting was hitting. There were some good averages posted the first couple of years in the 60s, and but by 63, 64, uh, we were already seeing baseball as it was going to be for the next, not just through the 1968 when they changed the strike zone bit and they reduced the mound size, but it, we continued into the early 70s. You know, hitting, hitting was declined, and there were, there were, you know, the power numbers were down too. In the seven, 1970s, there were only four hitters in the American League who had as many as 40 homers in the season. Uh, now look at you know, look what's going on now. I mean, there are uh, what, 120 the something hitting over 20 home runs. This season, oh God, yeah. you get a whatever the number was, I know it was in the 120 somewhere, but. Yeah. Uh, the uh, National League race that year was basically two teams, uh, the Cardinals and the, the Dodgers and the Cardinals. The Cardinals had made a tr- uh, trade which really increased their uh, uh, pr- productivity of Pirates after 1962 when they finished a good uh, fourth-place finish with 93 wins. 
uh, decided that Dick Groat uh, was expendable and they were going to make Dick Schofield their regular shortstop who had been the utility player his whole career. So they traded uh, Groat to the Cardinals essentially for uh, uh, pitcher Don Cardwell. And uh, Groat solidified the Cardinal infield and uh, the Pirates fell into eighth place that season. And it wasn't until Gene Alley came along that they were able to get a uh, shortstop who could play regularly and, uh, you know, return to being a decent team. The Cardinals, uh, the Dodgers, Koufax came into his own. He was 25-5 and five that season and uh, had a 188 ERA, and he struck out uh, over 300 bats. He had 11 shutouts, complete game shutouts, which, of course, now is uh, – that's something that's totally impossible. And he just dominated everything. He pitched his second no-hitter. And uh, they won by five games over the Cardinals. The Cardinals made a big rush uh, toward the end of the season where they won 19 out of 20. This was also Stan Musial's last season. Uh, and uh, they won 19 out of 20. The one loss uh, I attended because I was in Forbes Field and the uh, uh, Bob Veal, the Pirates, shut them out. And then they went They went home for a three-game series with the Dodgers. Everybody expected the Dodgers to fold up again like they had done the year before, but the Dodgers went and swept all three games there and uh, managed to win the uh, pennant by five games. Don't forget to mention Dick Nen. <laughs> Dick Nen, right, the uh, substitute first baseman and the uh, father of the Giants' uh, a closer, uh, Rob Nen, uh, hit a home run, uh, I think it was in the first game of that series, which the Cardinals, uh, uh, you know, figured to win, and he, he turned the whole series around, the whole season around, season around, and the Dodgers regrouped, cooled, cooled off the Cardinals, and uh, won fairly easily. So he come to the World Series. In 1963, it was Yankees against the Dodgers, which has been, this was the, uh, this is the eighth time that they were playing each other. And the Dodgers had won once in 1955. And the, the series opened at Yankee Stadium. And it was Colfax against Ford. Ford didn't have it that day, and the Dodgers got the, uh, four runs in the second inning and won the game 5-2. to two. Koufax struck out 15 in that game, and uh, which set a New World Series record, later to be broken by Bob Gibson. And they asked the inevitable Yogi Berra what he thought after that game. And his quote was, this is, I can see how he won 25 five games uh, during the regular season. This is why I can't see is how he lost five. Now, Yogi, of course, you know, as usual, hit the number right on the head. And then they, uh, the Dodgers won the second game behind Don Drysdale. They moved out to uh, Los Angeles. And the uh, third game was uh, Johnny Padres beat Jim Bouton. one nothing. And uh, the Yankees just totally stopped hitting. And the fourth game, Colfax came back and uh, beat Whitey 4 2 to 1. Uh, Mantle hit a home run in that game uh, uh, for the Yankee run. Uh, Frank Howard hit a home run off Whitey 4 for the Dodger run at that point. And then the eighth inning, uh, there was the Dodgers had a runner on first base and. Uh, there was a ground ball hit, and Joe Pepitone, who was playing first base, couldn't see the throw because the ball got lost in the uh, white shirts behind the uh, uh, behind the stand in the stands. And uh, this were, these were the days when all the World Series games was, were still being played in the daytime. And uh, the Dodgers scored a run off that, and uh, Colfax beat them uh, uh, two to one in Game Four, and it was a four-game sweep. The Yankees set all sorts of negative hit, hitting records 
for a team in that series, and which would do, uh, be broken three years later by the, the, the Dodgers themselves yeah. when they were swept by the Orioles. <clears throat> but that put an end, a very quick end, to a season that for a lot of people was not very, very satisfactory. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the MVPs in the National League was Colfax, and the American League was Elston Howard, who really didn't have that great a season, but uh, uh, numbers-wise, but uh, he was considered a clutch player and influence on uh, uh, the Yankee pitching. Uh, he had taken over as a full-time regular by then, and he was the first African-American to win the MVP in the American League. Uh, the uh, bank title in the American League was won by Carl Yastrzemski. Home runs with Dick Stewart. Uh, the uh, RBIs were... Uh, oh God, who the hell was the RBI? I think, well, when did Stewart win? So Stewart won the RBIs and Cooper won the home runs. I stand corrected. And the leading ERA uh, winner was... Uh, the White Sox pitcher Gary Gary Peters. Yeah. This is, this, uh, Sandy Colfax in the National League swept everything in pit, pitching wise. He won the uh, uh, ERA crown with 188. He won the strikeout crown. He won the best percentage, and he won the uh, not only the most valuable player in the league. He won the Cy Young Award, which at that time was still uh, being given only out, out only to one pitcher. The uh, bank title was won by Tommy Davis for the second straight year of Dodgers, but he had dropped from 346 to 326, and his RBI total went down from 153 to 88. The 88 uh, RBI still led the Dodger team. The home runs were uh, 44 shared by two number 44s, Henry Aaron and Willie McCovey, and Henry Aaron drove 130 runs to win that uh, Crown in the uh, National League. So then we come yeah, to another, the 90s. Um, yeah. We, the, we, yeah, we, we slid by another name that's also uh, was impacted heavily by the time which he played, and that's Frank Howard. Yeah. <clears throat> Howard was the, almost the equivalent of, of Killebrew, and, and, and his power numbers were certainly all there. Uh, he didn't quite, draw quite as many walks as Killebrew. Uh, but he was a very, very good ball player, and he could have been a major star in the NBA as well. Uh, he was drafted after his junior year of college. He'd been an All-American basketball player at Ohio State, and I think he was an All-American in baseball, too. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Howard went on to have a very long, very productive career, uh, despite some struggling. And we start with the Dodgers and particularly the changes in you know, the pitching and, and the strike zone and so forth. Uh, he played a lot of bad adjusting. <clears throat> he played a lot of bad Washington teams also. So a lot of bad teams after he left yeah. the Dodgers. Yeah, that's another thing that held him back. But uh, Howard, you know, under different circumstances and certainly in a different era, would have been a would have been in a conversation when uh, after he retired for the Hall of Fame, I think. As it is, uh, I don't think there's ever been much mention of it or much much discussion, really. And there, there probably should be, but I don't think it'll ever happen. Well, there were a lot of hitters. Uh, I can think of, uh, in particular, Billy Williams, even though he did wind up making the Hall of Fame, and Vader Pinson, the players who peaked during, uh, hitters that peaked during uh, the era from 1963 to 1968, and numbers were uh, oh, yeah, Tony well, was suppressed was because of the conditions at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, it, was unfor- it was an unfortunate time to, to, to be a hitter and, and be playing. It was like it was like the dead ball era in many ways. Only uh, you didn't. It was a different kind of game, and they were still playing long ball, but <laughs> there wasn't much in between. And uh, Base feeling did did begin to increase. Maury Wills really ramped it up, and then well, we're going to be talking next in '64 about Lou Brock. And when Brock arrived, things really began to jump around, and uh, so stealing became a, a major part of the game. 
uh, after many, many years where it had been more of it. It, it really hadn't had any base to the consequence uh, almost since Max Carey left in the, in, the, in the 1920s. Frisch stole and George Case stole a lot of bases in the American League, but yeah, uh, uh, Werber, but there really were very few guys. Who I remember Don DiMaggio in 1950 was the American League with 15 stolen bases. Yes, yeah. And in 1957, one of my favorite. A lot of teams that have been glad to have 15 stolen bases. My, my favorite bad team of the 50s, the uh, in the American League, the 1957 Washington Senators stole 13 as a team. Yeah. They're led by uh, uh, Julio Bocara, the first baseman, who stole three. So we get to 1964, which turned out to be a much more interesting year than 1963. You had two uh, nail-biting pennant races, uh, and uh, there was a lot of excitement uh, and a lot of strange things that happened uh, that that dur- during that season. Uh, we'll start with the American League. The Yankees won their fifth straight pennant, and this was uh, turned out to be the uh, Less gasp of their dynasty, and they won by they had uh, uh, retired Roy Hamey, the general manager, after 1963. They promoted Ralph Hauk from field manager to general manager, and they made Yogi Berra, who had retired after a stellar uh, uh, 17-year career as a player, uh, they made him manager. And uh, there were some pitching shortages, and uh, they beat out the White Sox uh, by one game and the Orioles by two games that year. The rest of the league, uh, you needed a telescope to find. And, uh, you know, Whitey Ford uh, won 17 games, 17 and 6. Uh, Boughton won 18 games, 18 and 13. Uh, Al Downing won, uh, I think it was 13 games. And they, had, they were so short for a fourth starter that they had to bring up Mel Stottlemyre in August from AAA. Uh, was a, you know, he was a rookie that, that season. And he won nine games in the, basically half the season. It was also uh, the last great year for Mickey Mantle. And Mickey hit over 300. He had 35 home runs, 111 RBIs, and that was uh, his last great season before his injury started to, uh, to uh, mount, and he started his downward slide. And of course, that season was famous because of the harmonic incident when uh, they had just been swept by the White Sox in Chicago and taken the bus to the airport. And Phil Lins was playing a a utility infield, was playing a harmonica in the back of the bus. And Yogi Berra got furious for one of the few times in his life and yelled uh, Lins to cut it out. And and the story was that Berra's voice didn't carry, uh, couldn't carry to the back of the bus. So uh, Phil uh, Lins said, what did he say? And Mickey Mantle was sitting there, Lins, so he said, play it louder. So uh, <clears throat> when he started playing it louder, uh, Berra really got uh, tipped off, went to the, the bus, slapped at the uh, uh, arm out of Phil Lindsay's hand, and uh, it was a whole, a whole uh, real to-do after that. And uh, it got all sorts of publicity, but for some reason the Yankees managed to rally after that incident and they played uh, terrific ball for the last uh, six weeks of the season. Uh, after September, they got uh, Pedro, Pedro Ramos uh, from the Indians, and uh, he was uh, a bullpen stopper, which was something they had been missing all season. And uh, he uh, helped propel the Yankees uh, into the World Series. Of course, uh, being acquired after September 1st meant that he wasn't eligible for the World Series. And uh, Yogi went back to one well, of my all-time Yankee hatreds, Pete Mickelson. And we'll get to him a little bit later. And uh, the American League uh, batting title was won by a rookie, 
outfielder that, uh, that came to the Minnesota Twins by the name of Tony Oliva, who was one of the best pure hitters I had ever seen in my life. Yeah, it was a yeah. joy to watch this guy. Yeah, and he's another one who probably yeah. had sensational numbers. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. For that era, but uh, you know, if he had played well, in that era, he was, was the poster boy. He was yeah. the poster boy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, he was the rookie of the A one bag title. And uh, Dick Stewart, uh, I think, believe won the home runs that year. No, he won the home runs. Brooks Robinson led the league in RBIs, and Tom Killebrew had 47 home, 49 home runs that year to win the win the home run title in the American League that season. The ERA uh, leader was Dean Chance of the Los Angeles Angels, who had won 20 and lost nine as a breakout year for him, and he had beaten the Yankees five times, and shut them out five times. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and he was, uh, you know, for some reason he just, uh, you know, threw his glove out there and they couldn't touch him. Uh, and uh, in the National League, the that Angels was a whole feeling. Of, the Angels were feeling pretty good, feeling pretty good team very soon after after the expansion. Yeah, uh, but yeah, they were, you know, they were they were a competitive team. Uh, by 63, 64. And, well, the 63, they finished. Even in 60, even 62, they were, they were beginning. 62, they finished third as a second year team. And they yeah, fell all the way to twice. And it looked like this team had something on the other expansion team. Yeah, so they fell all the way to ninth place. It'd be the first to emerge. And, yeah, and it, uh, took a long, long time before they, before they became playoff bound. Uh, and the National League was complete chaos. Uh, you had five teams finishing with eight games of uh, each other. Uh, the Cardinals, uh, Phillies, and Reds went down to the last weekend. The Giants were three games out, and the Braves were eight games out. The uh, Phillies got off to a fairly decent lead for most of the season, and into the final two weeks, they... Uh, had a six and a half game lead with 12 games left, and they managed to lose 10 in a row uh, before winning the last two games of the season. The losing 10 in a row caused the caused them to drop out of first place. The manager Gene I Mark, saw the, I saw the I saw the key game on TV. They were playing Cincinnati, and uh, nothing nothing game. Chico Ruiz of the Reds stole home. And uh, so he fought that game one nothing, and it began an unbelievable spiral that uh, Gene Mark just couldn't. Yeah, if I remember reading correctly, Frank Robinson was up when uh, Ruiz decided to steal home. Yeah, yeah, and that was a surprise, of course, and it worked. And uh, And, uh, Gene did not have a deep pitching staff. He didn't trust any pitchers other than the the Jim Bunny and Chris Short. Well, he had Art Mahaffey. No, Mahaffey was on the way down. He didn't trust Mahaffey. He didn't trust Culp. He didn't trust uh, Dennis Ben. He didn't trust anybody other than uh, Short and uh, Bunning, and he started pitching them on two days rest, and they couldn't handle it. Yeah, Bunning, uh, when he appeared at the uh, Sabre Convention in Louisville in 1997, uh, discussed this when he made his keynote speech. He discussed 1964, which Mark for the rest of his life would not do. And he said, yeah, he panicked and uh, yeah, we were overused. <clears throat> so the Cardinals and Reds, and the Cardinals uh, who were uh, slumping in uh, August, uh, despite the fact that they had acquired Will Brock from the uh, Cubs, Fernie Brolio, uh, before the June trading deadline, had decided to fire Johnny Keane. And they had already fired the general manager, Bing Devine, because uh, uh, Gussie Bush had brought back 83-year-old Branch Rickey as his advisor. So, uh, but the Cardinals put it together. They had the, an all-star infield that year at the all-star game. They had Bill White, 
uh, first, Julian Javier second, Dick Grohl is short, and the National League MVP, Ken Boyer, at third base. I should have mentioned the American League MVP that year was Brooks Robinson. So he had two third yeah. basemen. I think for the first and only yeah. time winning MVP. That was, that was the first. Yeah. And uh, they rallied behind uh, Bob Gibson and Ray Sadecki. And they they had to beat the Mets, who came in there. Uh, yeah, in the usual, uh, for those days, uh, last place, uh, deep last place finish finishes and they beat the Cardinals the first two games on the weekend. The Friday night, Alvin Jackson beat Bob Gibson one nothing before the Cardinals won the uh, finally won the last day of the season and with the Phillies being the Reds too, the Reds were knocked out. And uh, that year the Reds manager uh, Fred Hutchinson had to resign in mid-season because he was dying from cancer and he would pass away in uh, November of that year, and they brought in the the uh, home run hero from the 1950 Phillies, Dick Sisler, to manage them the, re- the rest of the season. And uh, the Giants were in it till uh, the last week uh, uh, with Willie Mays and uh, McCovey and uh, Orlando Cepeda and Juan Marichal and Gerald Perry, but they didn't have have enough elsewhere to complete it, but it turned out that the Cardinals won by one game over the Phillies and Reds, who were tied for second, and there were people who were hoping that the Cardinals would lose to the Mets the last day of the season, so uh, there, there would be a three-way tie, which had never never had happened in the major leagues before. That would have been really weird to uh, conduct a uh, playoff uh, among three teams uh, to get a league champion to decide. That was that was interesting because one of the things that saved the '60s uh, were there were, the, were some really really down to the wire pennant races. When we get to 1968, which is where we're going to finish, uh, you, you really had you had. Yeah, both races were awful. Seven, like 1967 and '68, uh, you, you really had some excitement. In the last in the last couple of days of the season, sixty eight didn't have anything. They both came. Sixty eight didn't, but sixty seven was. Yeah, and you had sixty six. You had the National League. Uh, extraordinary. And sixty five, you had the National League yeah. also. Yeah, yeah, and it, uh, that was what I think that. that but you're, I think you're absolutely right on that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely yeah. right on that. If it had been all the, if it had been the Yankees throughout the sixty. Uh, in the way it was in the 50s and even most of the 40s. I, I don't know where, where baseball, I think baseball would have given way to the NFL a lot sooner than it did. Um, the NFL wants the two leagues merged, the, AF, the AFL and the NFL, and they were putting out uh, a pretty good product. And Monday Night TV came in, was giving baseball all it could handle as far as in spectators. And a lot of people were were going over from baseball to football, so I mean it uh, <clears throat> it hurt it hurt the game, uh, but it saved it in a way that the independent races did. You know, one little game I forgot to mention in 1963 was played out in San Francisco, I think in July, and uh, the Giants beat the Braves one nothing in 16 innings. In fact, there was a book that. Uh, came out uh, a while back on this game. Juan Marichal, the Giants, and Warren Spahn, who was 42 years old at the time, went the entire route. Spahn gave up a home run to Willie Mays in the bottom of the 16th, and the Giants won the game one nothing. I don't know if you remember yeah. that one, but that was just... I, uh, I, do, I do remember that game. I do remember now, of course, with the pitch counts, <laughs> the odds on that happening... Anything like that happening again? Yeah, they're just you know. Uh, now, now they're pulling guys out when they're still in the fourth and fifth inning. Yeah, I've seen that a number yeah. of times this season. Also, uh, one of the things that uh, happened is that uh, 1963 turned out to be uh, Warren Spahn's last great year. He uh, fell off tremendously in 1964. 
uh, with the Braves. And in 1965, between the Mets and the Giants, he would uh, fall off even more, and that would be the end of his incredible Major League career. But now we get to the World Series in 1964. As the Yankees and the Cardinals, for the first time since 1943, that these two were facing each other in the World Series, the fifth time overall, each team had won twice. And uh, the Yankees lost the first game. Whitey Ford came down with a bad arm. And uh, once he was removed from that game, was unavailable for the rest of the series. Also, uh, Tony Kulback had come down with a neck injury, and uh, he was unable to play in that series. And the Yankees used Phil Lins at shortstop the whole, uh, for the whole seven games. In the second game, uh, Mel Stoutlemeyer beat Bob Gibson. And uh, that was the only game, the World Series game, that Gibson would lose until the final game of 1968. In the third game, which was played at Yankee Stadium, uh, it was Kurt Simmons against uh, Jim Bouton. It was 1-1 going to the bottom of the ninth. Simmons, who uh, had missed the 1950 World Series with the Phillies because he was in uh, the military service, uh, was pulled out after the eighth inning. They brought in a knuckleball of Barney Schultz in the bottom of the ninth. And the first pitch that uh, Schultz uh, threw the Mickey Mantle Mickey Mantle hit it out, and the Yankees won 2-1. to one. Then came the critical fourth game. The Yankees got up very, very quickly, 3-0. Uh, to nothing. Okay, They knocked out Grace Sadecki, who was the starter. And in the fourth inning, fifth inning, fourth or fifth, I forget which, I have to look that up. I'm sorry, people. Uh, Bobby Richardson made a te- booted a tailor-made double play. I mean, the ball was hit right to him. All he had to do was field it to short the first, and they're out of the inning. Well, he booted it, and the bases were loaded. Up, up comes Ken Boyer. He hit a grand slam home run, put the Cardinals ahead 4-3, to three, and the Cardinals for the rest of the game used Roger Craig and Ron Taylor in relief, and they held the Yankees hitless. They won the game 4-3, tie the series up. Then came the pivotal fifth game. And Gibson, it was Gibson against Stoutlemeyer. Uh, the Cardinals had a 2 nothing lead going into the bottom of the ninth. And Tom Tresh, of all people, had a uh, two-run home run. I think it was Tom Tresh. It might have been Pepitone. I'm not sure. I think it was Tom Tresh. I had a two-run home run in the bottom of the ninth to tie the game up at two. And right before he was up, there was a uh, there was a uh, Pepitone hit a slow roller where he was called out at first base by a hair. And there were people who thought that, that he was safe on that play. If he had been safe, the home run would have won the game for the Yankees. But it didn't. So I go to the 10th inning. And who does Berra bring in? Pete Mickelson, who already had a reputation in New York for, uh, you know, blowing games in relief. And he proceeded to do that. He gave up a three-run home run to Tim, Tim McCarver at the top of the tenth, and they wound up losing that game five to two. So they're down three games to two. They went back to St. Louis. The Yankees won the sixth game. Bouton won, his, uh, won the, uh, uh, the game eight to three, and uh, they had a couple of home runs. And then in game seven, the series was tied three up. It was Gibson against Stoutlemeyer, who was pitching. Stoutlemeyer was pitching on the. Both of them were pitching on two days rest. And Stoutlemeyer didn't have it. The Cardinals got out to a uh, seven to two lead by the sixth inning, and even though Gibson was shaky. The rest of the game, he pitched a complete game, and the Cardinals won the series 7-5. to It was their first the World Series win since 1946. And it's really ironic because uh, Stan Musial, who had retired after 1963, was not around for that. 
but the key was bringing Lou Brock from the Cubs, who uh, hit close to 350 during his time with the Cardinals that season. And Brock uh, was quoted as saying he, when he got to the Cardinals, was being liberated from the Cubs, who was still in their uh, crazy College of Coaches experiment. And uh, he said that uh, with the Cubs, he didn't know whether he was coming or going. And what happened after that series was in- totally insane. You remember that? Yeah. He- Johnny Keane, who was the manager of the world champion Cardinals, Cardinals. who they were ready to fire, uh, was offered a new contract by uh, the owner, Gussie Bush. He turned it down, no. Meanwhile, over in the Yankee land, Ralph Houck was dissatisfied with the way Yogi Berra handled the team, even though they had wound up winning the pennant and came within the uh, game of winning the World Series. So they fired Yogi, and they brought Johnny Keene in from the Cardinals to manage the Yankees. So the winning World Series manager was replacing the losing World Series manager. And the Cardinals wanted to hire... Leo DeRocha, but the stake was so bad in St. Louis that he told DeRocha, we can't hire you, we've got to bring in somebody familiar. So he uh, hired Red Shanes, uh who uh, finished, the, finished the playing career up in 1963 with them, and uh, Red Shanes had uh, spent most of his career with the Cardinals and turned out to be a pretty pretty good manager. Yeah, but that was... Uh, and that top it off, uh, yeah, yeah, during the same week all this was happening, uh, the Kiev Khrushchev was removed from power in the Soviet Union, and the Chinese set up their first atom bomb. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it was a very, uh, October 1964 was a very hectic week. Uh, David Halberstam, uh, a number of years ago, wrote a book uh, called October 60, 1964, discussing the Cardinals and the Yankees, and basically saying the Cardinals, who were... Uh, one of the teams in the National League who uh, 17 years before uh, were uh, the team that was most opposed to the coming of Jackie Robinson in the National League had several black players that were uh, uh, Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood, Bill White that were played very prominent uh, roles on that team while the Yankees uh, really uh, only had uh, Elson Howard and Al Downing Plus the Yankees, uh, that would be the end of the dynasty. They would collapse. And yeah, uh, it would, but there were the black black players um, in, the, in the National League was head and shoulders above the American. Oh yeah, a big big acquisition in 1964. Who was the spark plug for the Phillies? It was rookie uh, at the time. It was called Richie, and he didn't like it. Yeah, and he insisted that he it be changed to Dick. His name was. You know Richard Allen, and they did change it to Dick. Um, but he, as a rookie, he was Richie Allen, and he was Rookie of the Year, and he had a fantastic, fantastic year, and um, went on to a, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, almost a, a, both a dream and a nightmare career. Uh, an extraordinary player, extraordinary talent. Uh, some don't think he got all that he should have from his talent. Others think that he did and just was never really fully appreciated for what he brought to the game. And he, too, was caught in the downdraft of uh, the pitching explosion. And yeah, and also uh, you know. uh, there, there were not, not quite a number of managers uh, at that point that uh, really uh, couldn't handle the uh, no, couldn't. revolution, the uh, social revolution that was happening in the 60s. Yeah, they could. And they, they yeah, and, so you had you had yeah, guys were. like guys like that. You had guy uh, guy uh, the Yankees had was Joe Pepitone who replaced the yeah. Bill Scourin at first base, and Pepitone had a, you know what they say in the trade a million dollar talent and a ten cent head. Yeah, and a lot of people think that he he had the tremendous ability that he he uh, totally squandered during his time in the major leagues. Yeah, I came to New York. And I moved there in 1965, and I'd come from Cleveland. I'd come from Ohio. I wasn't living in Cleveland in 64, but I was sort of following the Indians. 
That was a, a pivotal year in Yankee history. And I was I was on the ground floor that year. It was, it, okay, well, we'll get into we'll get the uh, next week. A big topic next week. Uh, next next uh, time will be the crash of the Yankees because it was not only fast; it was very very loud. Yeah, but uh, that 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 can take up a whole program in itself. But we'll try to limit it. Okay, David. I think that'll be it for tonight. I want to thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Always. And, I, and uh, uh, I hope the people who listen to this uh, uh, get something out of it. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.